I am really excited uh, to have Lisa and Gail here. The uh, the book um, is, I think, a fabulous book. Uh, as I was telling Lisa and Gail earlier, uh, the final chapter happens to be my favorite chapter. Uh, you have to read it and you'll find out uh, why. But um, it's, it's just a really wonderful book. Lisa Napoli is a former intern, unpaid intern in the New York Bureau, CNN Bureau. She's a reporter for the New York Times, been a reporter for the Times, Marketplace on Public Radio, MSNBC, KCRW. She's the author of two previous books, Radio Shangri-La and uh, Ray and Joan, about Ray and Joan Kroc from uh, McDonald's fame. And then Gail Evans, we're fortunate to have Gail here. I've known Gail for years and years and years. She's the former executive vice president of CNN News Group. She started there in 1980 at its inception. Prior to that, she had worked for a congressman. She had worked for a senator. She uh, then worked in the office of special counsel to President Johnson, the Import-Export Bank, then after her CNN days, she's written two books, uh, been a corporate speaker and a consultant on women in the workplace, and currently teaches at Georgia Tech. So, uh, Gail Evans, Lisa Napoli, we are so glad to have you here. I'm going to turn it over to Gail. Thank you, Tony. And Tony, you need to have a question in this tonight. I, you're quoted in the book. I saw you there. And, you know, so you're allowed to ask a question as well. Uh, <laughs> unusual, but right you're in this. So I'm going to begin a little differently tonight, because usually when I do one of these author interviews, the first thing that we talk about are the content of the book uh, and the rest. And I always have a few process questions at the end and we never get to them. But I, I said to Lisa, I actually think people, a lot of people think of writing books um, a lot of people, I, can, I know two people on this call I've seen already who are writing books uh, and the rest. So I, I want to ask you a couple questions about how you actually do it. So the beginning, Lisa, my first one is, what in your life and background led you to write this book? And why did you write it now? Excellent question. Um, thank you all for being here. And thanks for having me. And thanks for doing this, Gail. Um, well, this book was basically inspired by a friend I had when I worked at CNN Headline News in the mid 80s. My friend Sid Leader, whose mother-in-law, Diane Durham, you all, many of you may know, um, Sid said to me after he read my last book, which was the origin story of McDonald's, that I should write a book about CNN's upcoming 40th anniversary. This was several years ago. And I said, well, there have to have been books that were written. And he said, well, they were, there were, and they were old, but why don't you do an oral history? And I don't know if you've seen these wonderful oral histories about HBO. Well, actually it's being done about HBO right now, about uh, CAA, the, the talent agency and Saturday Night Live. And I thought, oh yeah, that's a great idea. Well, then I realized, how impossibly hard doing an accurate oral history was, especially since there weren't, wasn't that much time. So that's what inspired it. Um, it was a hard sell because a lot of publishers didn't want to do a book about history of CNN. If I wanted to do something about CNN now and CNN versus Fox, great, but they didn't want the history, but I just thought it was really important to tell it. Um, probably because I danced around the edges of it as a young person and saw that the milestone was an interesting time to reflect back. So. so interesting. So how do you determine who you talk to and when you've done enough research? Because one of the things I thought about with this is that if you talk to me, I send you to certain people. If you talk to Tom Johnson, he sends you to other people. If you talk to Reese, he would send you to another set of people. So right. how did you determine that you had enough people that you finished your research? And how well, did you start it? Yeah, it's that those are really tough questions and also important questions. So 
basically you could do a book like this, especially this book is a slice of CNN's life, so to speak. It's not what they call in the biography business cradle to grave. It's, um, you know, the beginning till the end or the current moment. It was a slice of life, which was the only way I could have done it in the period of time that I had to do it, which was roughly it was it took me a little over two years start to finish. Um, but yeah, every single person you talk to leads you to somebody else or to something else, some other treasure trove, especially when you're doing something that's that's encompassing like this, as opposed to just a story about one person. And knowing you're done, you're never done. There's always more. Um, there's stuff out there that I know I never got my hands on. But I, the hardest part it, when you're writing a book, at least for me, is coming up with the structure. And in this case, the structure was figuring out how to zero in on this moment in time that goes up to uh, the part that Tony mentioned at the very end and begins somewhere else. It really, it really became a kind of brief history of television news or breaking television news um, told through the lens of how CNN got started. But there's obviously 50 million other ways that this story could have been told uh, through the eyes of so many different people and Ted Kavanaugh and Bill Tush and Ted Turner and Reese, all to me were quintessentially important people in, in explaining how it launched, how it got off the ground. Plus they're all fascinating, interesting people. The other thing that's hard is that when you're talking to someone, uh, memory, memory is inexact. Um, five of us will have different memories of a moment in time. Uh, even if we were all there, it's like a news story. Everybody's going to have a different perspective. And it, it's really hard to get people to reflect on something long ago any differently than they probably have before. And that's why printed materials, and in this case, newspaper articles, and in the case of the number, a number of books that were written about CNN by people who were inside, or books that were written about Ted, who obviously I couldn't have spoken to because of his health condition, um, many, many videos of Ted's existed that had not been mined, um, you know, looked at reflectively historically. So the, the reporting of it is completely different than when you're reporting a news article, a news story of any in any medium, because you have the time to sort of take this step back and look at this wider look and talk to different people, many of whom you may not ever quote, but who may corroborate that this is what it was like when the little girl fell in the well. And that's what happened when we made this decision. And um, yeah, I don't know if that's making no, any that's, sense. No, that's, that's great. So just one other real structure one, which is, um, I remember in the old days at CNN, we, we had boards where we put cards up for every hour so we could figure out who the, you know, we didn't get confused about guests. How did you keep the characters? Do you have a system for keeping the characters and the timeline straight? Um, I don't. I should, but I don't. But I, I, um, I, the, the short answer is I don't. And I know I belong yeah. to this group of biographers and they all meet and they talk. You know, it's the only place in the world where you can go and talk about footnotes and endnotes with people and structure. And, and how do you how do you attach that? You know, I talked to Gail on this date. That's easier than than extracting information from newspaper articles. Um, but yeah, I don't have any good system, and I'm writing this other book now, and oh, right. it's so it, it's it's a complicated thing. I mean, I, it would be really nice to have people who were skilled researchers who, I, I mean, I'm a skilled researcher now, but somebody who went to library school who knew how to organize research, but I don't. <laughs> my and my final process thing is: Do you write on a schedule? Do you write a certain number of pages every day? You know, a certain. <sighs> Hour, number of hours and can you write any place that was my big one was can do you have only one place where you can write or do you write oh my god could you write any place i need to be in total silence i don't know about you yeah i wrote I, in my office at cnn after six o'clock at night yeah i so i unfortunately have had the these last several books have all been on crazy deadlines um and so i've had to work 12 hours a day. It's extremely unhealthy. 
Um, and I would tell anybody else who was doing it that they were crazy, but the only way to get it done was to work almost constantly and to have no other commitments or, or things competing for your time, which is also really hard to do because these books don't pay particularly well. But I um, basically, I just, I can only work at home and I can only work in quiet. Although I did write some of my book about McDonald's in a library uh, near my parents' house around Thanksgiving. So, but it, it's, it, I just need, I need to wall out the world to get it, to get it done. And part of that is because a lot of it is the intensity of the research and synthesizing the research at the same time that you're actually writing the book. So. Interesting. So you mentioned your book about the Crocs. Uh, I'm just curious, is there any, any lessons you learned from the fast food kings that apply to the fast news king? It's so funny that you ask that because so many times in the course of researching Ted Turner and watching endless Ted Turner videos, which is a delight and a fascination. I mean, it, it's incredible. I thought about Ray Kroc and I thought about how similar their personalities were and their drives were and um, their just unbridled motivation to to make something work. Uh, there are many differences too. Ted Turner, much more handsome than Ray and Ray differently brusque, but definitely the whole eye on the prize that I'm going to make this happen, uh, you know, and, and almost unbridled optimism. Uh, although I don't know that Ray Kroc would ever consider him, have considered himself an optimist. He probably would have. But um, the crazy larger than life, uh, get out of the way mentality. Absolutely. Absolutely. Of course, the major difference is that in this case, it was Ted's baby. Um, and in the case of, of Ray Kroc, it was someone else's baby that he overtook to. Um, but he had a vision for this for this bigger picture. But yeah, it definitely an invention of something new. Uh, definitely lots of similarities there, for sure. Interesting. So on a more solemn note, um, Paul Beckham, who was a, an integral part of, of all of Turner Broadcasting, um, died last week. Uh, I just wish, you, you know, for those of us who thought about it, a few moments of, you know, what was Paul's contribution to this venture? Well, so I I don't know too much about Paul, partially because I didn't speak about him, but also because the men behind the scenes, and they were mostly men, Gail, as everyone who's listening probably knows, was a pioneer in terms of management. It's just the presence of women was un unusual, especially in the early part of the Turner empire. But the money men... Uh, were a different sort of animal, so to speak, than uh, I shouldn't use that word than than the um, than the people who were more on the production side of things. And those guys engined Ted's craziest dreams. Uh, I believe that Paul Beckham, may he rest in peace, came in after Ted had made the super crazy decision of taking over Channel Seventeen. Uh, which happened in 1969 and officially happened in 1970, the takeover. And that was what really launched him into television. But yes, the men behind the scenes who who architected or orchestrated his financial wizard, wizardry um, definitely paid a, played a, an enormous role in Ted's empire building because they made things happen that really, um, you know, often seemed completely improbable so well so you meant to talk about money men in my years at cnn there was only one money man i ever thought about and that was burt reinhardt and so one of my questions to you is would see i mean reese came in reese was was there with ted with the vision but reese was gone you know within two years would CNN have survived without Bert's financial and strategic acumen? Probably not. I mean, it, it, it's a miracle that it did anyway, but but almost definitely, I mean, of course, it's impossible to know. And of course, what ultimately did Ted in was his unbridled 
expansion and sort of selling off bits of of the empire to make other things possible. But um, yeah, you know, it, it, I'm writing this book right now about the creation of NPR, which of course was not a nonprofit. I, it was a nonprofit versus Ted's empire, which was, but uh, the parallels there are extremely similar because they were both in pre very precarious situations for many years of their existence. And Bert famously um, kept it to budget. Now, I think Reese understood, Reese being the first president um, and, and sort of the main architect of the content side, I hate that word, but of, of CNN, really understood uh, the idea that it had to be lean and mean in a way that nobody had ever experienced quite before, because his whole world before that, his and Bert's, were always lean and mean entities. They were never places that had limitless budgets like CBS. Um, so, but what what would have happened had, had Reese and Ted not fallen out is, is just one for the books or imagination or pints of beer. It's just, it's, it's an incredible thing to think about if, um, if, if it could have kept going. And you of course lived, and some of the people on this call lived through that precariousness. I, I even, when I came to work for Headlines in 84, I remember times where we were told to hold our paychecks. So, um, you know, wait till Monday to cash that paycheck. So, uh, yeah, yeah, it's an interesting Funny. to imagine. I, I remember one of the, our, when we were on take two, I remember one of the women from the finance running down the hall back in the old days at Techwood and saying, Gail, get your paycheck in the minute you get it because there's not enough money to meet the budget. And I don't know whether you talk to people, but I do remember the stories um, that I heard from Ed Turner and people about how the executives didn't cash their paychecks for, right. I think, one complete pay period because right. there wasn't enough money to pay the employees. And then there's the Kruger, the famous Kruger Ant story uh, of Ted cashing in the Kruger Ants to, to pay a couple of bills. So, yeah, I'm sure there's so much more that I did not uncover and I wish somebody had written about because it was close to the best for sure. Right. So you have any idea how many times we were almost in bankruptcy? Tell me. I don't know. I'm curious. <laughs> I never I never could tell. I could never tell because it did seem miraculously like, um, you know, the rabbit got pulled out of the hat at the last minute. And of course, you know, many terrific books have been written about both the CBS, the failed CBS acquisition deal, and then how everything devolved for, for Ted with Kerkorian and um, just, you know, the whole mess with AOL, obviously, and the real financial house of cards, um, you know, and as, as most people knew who watched it in the early days, and certainly anybody who worked there knows is the Ginsu knife guys really kept it going and it worked for them. So, uh, but yeah, I could never, I could never root out all of the financial problems that were there. <laughs> yes, many of us got our, our bonuses in Ginsu knives or Zamfir. Right, <laughs> right. <laughs> so we're talking about finances. One of the places that I think sometimes gets lost in the discussions about CNN are Myron Kandel, who just had his 90th birthday, and Stuart Barney who really reinvented financial news. Yes. How you do it. You want to talk a little about that, Lisa? I, I do, yes. And that was one of the problems in, in having this uh, very focused timeline. You could write an entire book about the New York Bureau and um, even more specifically about the financial journalism and the idea that, you know, that kind of journalism just did not exist on broadcasting at that point there was a wall street week was on pbs but you know the whole idea that you would turn on the news and watch anything on the news much less stock prices and and uh you know financial metrics that we are all that that are so much more popular so much more part of the vernacular today was unthinkable and myron and his team out of new york um and it really is incredible that uh reese had the presence to include that in the earliest part of CNN, they they really invented a whole form of financial journalism. Uh, and, and 
as with everything else we're talking about, is it good that we all watch the stock market the way we watch a baseball game? I don't know, but but that's what's happened as a result um, of their of their show and the whole idea of counter programming, having that show on at a time of the evening that um, was not a time you would have imagined that kind of, of you know a finance show to be on. All of it was was super innovative. Uh, so very interesting. You mentioned um, baseball. So I'm I'm curious, and and you're talking with people. Were the Braves a sports team that Ted was bought because of owning a sports team, or were they programming? Programming. Oh, absolutely programming. He had zero less than zero interest you know he was of course this celebrated yachtsman and i didn't realize i knew that he he was a yachtsman when i started doing this but i didn't realize just quite how celebrated he was but no he he had next to no interest in baseball he feigned interest in baseball once he bought the team and once he got the idea that the team was important programming for channel 17 uh, but no, it was it was not an um, like many men who buy these teams. That was their boyhood. Ray Kroc actually bought a team around the same time that Ted did, and it was his dream. That was his favorite sport, his favorite pastime. But no, and the stories um, actually, Paul Beckham's uh, business partner Bob Hope, not the comedian, uh, was the PR guy at the Braves and. The stories that he tells, both in his book, and I had the pleasure of talking to him a little bit about how Ted had this wild, um, outlandish vision for promotions of baseball that Bob Hope shared with him were just so fantastically P.T. Barnum, and they they helped, especially at a time when the, the team was not very good. So... Interesting. So one of other Ted's other ventures that doesn't get talked about much, uh, which I remember very well, was the Satellite Music Channel. The the uh, yeah, I looked it up. It's not it's it's not. Is it called the Satellite New that Music was the Channel? Satellite Music Channel wasn't that what it, it was called? It was no. It was um, Cable Music Channel. I think is what it was. Satellite. There was Satellite Night News, which of course right. you know cable, inspired uh, CNN. Right. But yeah, that was super short lived. Um, that was, you, he just, he had this vision for cable that now is so quaint and retro and outdated because cable is suffering or changing so much, um, cable as a, as a utility. Uh, but he had this, this vision and he was also, um, my favorite, the cable music channel, I don't know too much about, but I love the, the song, uh, when cable, I was cable when cable, cable wasn't cable. cool. Right. And uh, talking to people about the story about how that got shot in a studio in the middle of the night um, is, is just great. And how he went to these uh, television and, and cable. He was a hero in the, in the cable industry for his experimentation because he was doing it before anybody else um, really, well, anybody else except Jerry Levin uh, was, and he understood the power of it. And sometimes things failed, which is why it is, when you look at that, you know, it is entirely possible that CNN could have just completely tanked um, early on. It was just a, a wild hair, as as we say. Well, so very interesting. You mentioned Jerry Levin. So I have a, two, two questions about Jerry Levin. Um, the first one is talk a little about how circular, the way I think of it, Jerry Levin was in Ted's life and inspiration. And then do you have any idea why Jerry Levin fired Ted, got rid of Ted Turner? Um, I'll, I'll take the first question first, because I know much, much more about that. And that was actually a pleasure in this book was calling up Jerry Levin and having him take my call because I asked him a question that apparently that no one had asked him if ever in a really long time. And that was about the genesis of HBO, home box office. He was an executive at time right. time and he he was working to get HBO on to a satellite so that it was going to 
be more than a regional cable entertainment service that played for several hours a night. And if anybody remembers the Thrilla from Manila, that was his big, big launch was this prize fight um, coming from, emanating from Manila. And it was that announcement, the sheer announcement that he was going to do that, that made Ted uh, decide that he needed to do something else on cable besides put Channel 17 up onto it. And that's what we can thank. That moment um, is why Ted started CNN. Uh, he famously was gathered around with several executives of Channel 17 and basically trying to come up with what they could do since this Jerry Levin guy was going to do this thing with um, time and with entertainment. And of course, Ted owned the rights to many movies because of Channel 17 um, and his sister station in, in Charlotte. But he realized that if Jerry was going to do it and all the rights hassles and all of that, that um, that he that he'd have to switch gears and come up with something else. And that's when the idea was proposed for for CNN. So, yes. So he he knew Jerry. They were it was a small club like those of us who were on the Internet in the early days. There were very few people who were involved in that world. Um, and he he knew Jerry. Uh, he knew the people who were in the hardware business. And then, of course, it's interesting and ironic and just very cinematic that he sold pieces of the business to other cable carriers to help him balance his books and that he wound up, in essence, working for Jerry Levin. Uh, I'm sure there's all sorts of untold stories. I mean, he kicked he demoted Ted, but then Ted sort of got him kicked out. Um, uh, so it, it, there's a lot, there's a lot that we just don't know. And that I certainly don't know everything I know. I've just read in other people's depictions of that, that moment in time. I do remember waking up when I was working at MSNBC, I was the on-air internet correspondent when, um, when basically uh, AOL announced it was buying Time Warner. And I remember thinking, no, they've got, that, that's gotta be wrong. It's gotta be the other way around. So, oh, something's happened with our layout or screen. Are you still there? I'm here. Okay, good. Um, someone must have joined with the oh, somebody, audio. Right. Yeah, somebody's got some audio on. Um, anyhow, yeah, so I wish I knew more about that. But that, again, is I zeroed in on this very specific period of time. And there's so much I just don't, I don't know about that period. The good Harvard Business School case for somebody yes. today. Yes. But, so I, I want to get back to some of the early Ted stuff that you wrote about. I mean, what we understood or, and what we know is Ted thought television was the bastion of sex and violence and, and nudity. Um, and he hated news. I, 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 I know I read the quote, no news is good news. In the yes. Rest. How did he get from a prosperous billboard company into television and then into news when they, they were things he despised. Well, that was another reason I thought it was important to write this book now, because I don't think anybody remembers that. And certainly people who love or hate CNN would never imagine that the person who created it really had little interest in news. But basically, it's as simple as he saw this amazing new technology, this marriage of satellite and cable, and he'd seen what he'd been able to do with Channel 17. So he he read about what Jerry Levin was doing with this new fangled crazy service called HBO and just sat around with a bunch of guys to come up with what he could do himself with this technology. It really was that simple. He in the 70s, as did a lot of people, um, usually people who were m much more clearly intellectual, not that Ted was not incredibly smart, but people, you know, it was a very, television was something that people looked down on in the 70s because commercial television was a lot of sex and violence and craziness. And uh, Ted, even though he had a pretty wild life himself, was really disgusted by what he knew to be on television. And he thought that news was just extremely, um, excuse me, was extremely limited. And that's why he and Reese, even though they had virtually nothing in common, um, they got along so well because Reese hated what commercial television 
was like at that time too. He of course just didn't have the means and his whole point of view was that news was amazing and that there should be more of it. So it really was just a marriage of convenience and a moment in time that Ted couldn't, you know, he couldn't figure out how to put sports on this cable satellite marriage because that would co-opt his core business that was making him money on Channel 17. He couldn't do it with movies because he saw Jerry doing it and the movie licensing was too hard. Um, he wanted to do music. Somebody said that was a stupid idea. Who would wa watch music on television? So he didn't do that. And that's when someone said, oh, let's just try news. So it was not a calculated idea. Um, oh, we have to inform the world better. It was only after he started doing it that he recognized its importance. And interesting because I remember uh, Tom Johnson was on the call. I'm sure he remembers this too. I remember one day we were sitting in an executive committee meeting and Ted explained that the reason that CNN was in English around the world was the, and not in other languages. At that time, it was only in English was because um, it was like the, he had thought of the Tower of Babel and he wanted <laughs> to make sure that people all over the world could learn English so they'd have a vehicle to speak to each other. I thought it was sort of messianic, but it turns out it was really a business decision. I think it was, I think that he, um, certainly in the 70s, uh, leading up to the creation of CNN, he did not see it even as an international service. And that was interesting to me too. I didn't realize how uh, not grand the vision was when he started. It really was, let's get it out of the gate in a, in a national sense. That to him was spectacular. And then what happened was, of course, Fidel Castro was pirating the signal and that gave him the sense that uh, maybe there was much more to this than that. Um, but no, it, w it wasn't, nothing that I've found, I'd love to hear if I'm wrong, suggested <laughs> that he was, he was sitting, no, no, and that's a great story too. Um, I think he's, I think he got the religion of it and, and the importance of it once he saw what it was. And it took a guy like Fidel um, explaining it to him or just devouring his, his creation to make him realize just how powerful it was and what a tool it could be. Great. I've got a couple more questions I want to ask you, and then everybody begin lining up in chat. There are a bunch of people here who I know have good questions. But I, I'm just curious on a little more philosophic note. Um, Ted embraced this new technology of cable and satellite and made it mainstream. Um, what what can we that you know tell the the new tech leaders of today from what Ted learned in his experiences. What what how do we how do we bring some of that entrepreneurship and, and technology into some of the thoughts for today's tech leaders? Wow, it's a, that's a great question. Uh, and if I really knew the answer to that, I would probably be going out and doing consulting rather than sitting around and writing these crazy books. But I think you know, his fearlessness, and back to Ray Kroc for a minute, there there inability, incapacity to say that um, something couldn't be done is is really, and not, and not to think too far ahead of themselves, not to get caught up, is really what allowed them to succeed. Uh, but yeah, there. I don't think there was a sense of Reese's vision, certainly was that news would unfold with this new technology, because really what made CNN possible was a marriage of timing and opportunity with this new technology that was starting that didn't exist even just a few years before. And it wasn't just the satellite, it was videotape and computers and news and information could move more quickly. And I think that if you had asked Ted and Reese to say, okay, what do you envision the downside of all of this information and the always on of news is going to be, I don't know that they would have had an answer. I think they were so dazzled by the idea that they could provide the stream of information. And so how do you extrapolate that to technology to, you know, especially today when we're all more devo devoted and, and, and dependent on technology than ever before? Um, 
I, I just don't know. I covered technology for many years at the New York Times and then at MSNBC. And, you know, it, it seems like there's always unintended, con unintended consequences that um, people just can't, can't fathom. That's what unintended consequences are. And, uh, but I think but the entrepreneurial vision, the idea that you don't take no and that you don't let something sensible stop you because if, if Ted had really thought about it, really, there was no sense to any of this. Um, it just, it didn't make any sense. People didn't have any zeal for news. That's the other thing that's hard, was a hard sell for this book, is that it's really hard for even people our age to imagine that there was a time that news wasn't always available to us. Um, and it wasn't that long, you, you all, the pioneers at CNN made that happen, but it didn't exist before. So they really created a need for viewers, you know, a, a need on the part of viewers to want to tune in because it was they were laughed out of innumerable sales conferences and broadcasting where people said there's no way anyone will watch this. There's no way anyone has any interest because news was something that was boring before that. I mean, it was important, but it did not generate the numbers. It was the loss leader. In, in most television ventures, right? So uh, I don't have to tell you that because you you know some of the greats, but it, it was, it, it's really fascinating to look at Ray Kroc and, and Ted Turner and imagine that they just didn't want to slow down or, or give up to their detriment. Yeah. So Lisa, I'm curious for you, but I also, some of the people that, that are listening. So we envisioned news unfolding and the viewer could be there. And that is the beginning of the elimination of the gatekeeper. Yeah. So, you know, taking it way down the road, I mean, should we blame the advent of, of cable news for the deterioration of journalism in our society? A hundred percent. I mean, there are people who thought that, that radio news and then television news deteriorated journalism. And, you know, in many ways, of course, it did. It, it, it had a, a massive effect. The idea that there was mediation in a different way in, it, with broadcasting uh, than there was the mediation of my observing something and then writing it down. So each time, I mean, it's not CNN's fault, just like I always say that it wasn't McDonald's fault that we started eating fast food. There was a zeal for for food that was portable. And there there was this created zeal for information that was more um, quickly fed to us, if you will. But it definitely, I think, uh, I'm curious what other people think. I'm curious what you think. I think it definitely broke down our, um, you know, the, the need for editors. Um, everybody's an editor. Everybody's now a producer of something. Um, and that's, that's, definitely destroyed it as we know it. And then, of course, you add to it the introduction of competition to CNN, uh, which, you know, is Fox and then MSNBC. And those things came along and those really forced the issue of CNN. CNN, in, in its essence, was changing news. And then you along came competition with decided points of view. And that upset the whole balance because CNN had to make a choice. And of course, for a long time, it didn't make a choice to uh, devolve into what those other services are. Uh, and then now I think in my estimation, it has. So, but that was another tricky part with this book because I I wanted people to read it and have that conversation with each other. I, I didn't want to be the pundit saying, damn cable news, damn news. I, it's just made me think about um, my career arc um, and all that's happened over these decades and how, it, how it's, you know, if you look at where we are as a society today, uh, if you look at the pandemic a hundred years ago and the coverage of the pandemic and the, you know, everything obviously about the world was different then, um, it, it's a really, it's a really fascinating bit of food for thought uh, 
that's mind blowing when you think about how technology has changed our perception of every single event. Presidents, I remember as a young woman in college in the early 80s, studying that the first presidential debate uh, televised, that was televised, impacted the presidential election. And I didn't understand that. I'm born in 1963. I, I understood it, of course, but I didn't really get it. And now the more I think about it and I realize how much television has impacted politics uh, and, and governance, uh, I'm, this book I'm writing now, I'm looking at how C-SPAN, uh, how long the House and the Senate fought to the idea of cameras coming in because they knew the minute there were cameras on them all day long, that was going to screw everything up. Uh, and it, of course, you know, it opened it up too. All right, great. And I knew Tom Johnson would have a Tom, turn your I want to hear because I knew Tom Johnson would have a different point of view. Tom, will you join us for your thoughts? You have to turn your mic on. Up oh, there, you go. First, uh, I wanted to say with every ounce of honesty I have within me that I have tremendous admiration for the original team uh, and what the original team did. Uh, I also should emphasize uh, a conversation that I had with Ted before I accepted the job. I said, Ted, what is it that you most want CNN to be? He said, I want it to be the best news service on the planet. And I said, what else? And he said, that's it, pal. Then he said something to me that I have not said before publicly. He said, I would really like it to be the New York Times of television news. Uh, and I think in part it explains his bringing me from the Los Angeles Times after he had told the four uh, candidates, I guess the four leading candidates, that he would never go outside to get a newspaper guy, uh, but but he did. Next, we really did strive for quality. I mean, we did demand quality of ourselves. And, and I will also just convey to this group something that I have not said publicly. I may say it in my book. I'm working on a book, but but I think that Rupert Murdoch and Roger Ailes did more with Fox News, especially with the opinion side of Fox News, to degrade television news than any force that has existed. Uh, and so much uh, response to their soaring ratings. I mean, unbelievably so soaring ratings. And I think the CNN has really sought to hold the line in many ways, uh, and it so has very much so has MSNBC. But um, uh, I, I think that even now there's a chance, there's an opportunity for CNN to be the very best journalistic organization on the planet, including uh, in international, uh, which we made tremendous strides in international. I still think there are great opportunities there. The other point I wanted to make, we talked about women in power at CNN. And, and I just should say that Gail Evans, Susan Grant, the, 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 the impact of, of, of even bringing in a technology expert named Ella Hay Hassenfar, who virtually nobody's ever heard of before, but we. Oh no. That's what happened. Right. <laughs> the technology. <laughs> Tom, right. That's the gender issue here. When Tom, are you back? Gail, I, I, I want to say. Oh, here he is. I think he's back now. Are you back? Because Tony had Tony had something to say. Oh, Tony, yeah. You? What I was going to say is that one of the things that really interested me about Lisa's book is how many times. In the early days and before, everything just comes to the brink, whether it is Ted lost at sea uh, while he's sailing right before they've got to try and get cable uh, companies to, to sign on. Uh, he goes with um, electronic newsroom, and you don't know if, I mean, you have to order 
typewriters just in case everything goes down and how close he came so many times to having it all go away. Yes. Yes. That's uh, yeah. That's I loved that part of the story. And I thought that most people didn't remember that that had happened. Right. Um, that terror that people felt at the very beginning when the satellite, the satellite literally went missing. Well, Ted, Ted said he owed so much to Michael Milliken, Milken and uh, Junk Bonds because although Ted was paying like 18% to 20% on the Junk Bonds, Mike Milliken enabled Ted to have the funds to do so much, and, and, and also the Japanese banks. This was a time when the U.S. domestic banks, the Atlanta banks, wouldn't loan him anything. Yes, well, and then he tried to sell his station in, in Charlotte, and that yeah. got scuttled. Um, yeah, it, he had many, many obstacles. But, but Tom, I just want to riff on something you said. I just want to make it clear. I think that CNN was exceptional for so many years. But to Gail's question, just the idea of always on news yes. uh, really yes. changed how we consume news and changed the definition of news. Um, same thing with the Internet. I remember working at The New York Times in the early days of the Internet uh, when The New York Times was dealing with, oh, my God, we have to produce more quickly. Um, now, of course, they have tons of people who do just that. But that was a, that was a strange time for them. And it, it was a, another sort of pivot point in the news business. So I think it's just really important for us to look at how all of those pivot points got us to where we are today. But I don't mean to disparage that, that CNN in itself was not exceptional for a long time um, and, and, and to the highest standards, but it was, it was just, it's the dissolution of what is an editor and what is uh, what does it mean to report something as it goes? That's why I, I write that whole story about President Reagan being shot and how Bernard Shaw was steadfast in not reporting right. um, that the president or, or that James Brady had died because he knew it hadn't been verified. He had a journalistic core that is just it's it's difficult to match that today because this this zeal to be first. So I think just watching how it, it eradicated that standard over time is just important. And that's what I want, you know, for young people who are in the business, if they read this book at some point to say, oh, wow, you know, the whole ethos of reporting something live is different than, was different then than it is today. Yeah, it's interesting, Lisa. I, I, th I think about that when I listen to anchors who have opinions and I think to myself, Bernie Shaw, would have, you know, I, I don't even know how upset he would have been if anybody had ever thought that he had an opinion and that he, he had a side. He was there to report what he saw, um, not to have an opinion about it. And today we, we have anchors who have opinions about everything. Well, because what's happened is you don't have the money to have skilled, you know, you can't have a thousand Christian Amanpours everywhere. And it's much cheaper to have hacks like me who are flogging books to come on the air and scream at somebody else uh, until something happens. And that that's devolved. I think that that's what's devolved the, the essence of the really good reporting and and yes, it's it's a slow eradication, and it's this, it's also the rise of the celebrity journalist. The whole idea that um, you know Bernard Shaw was fine, amazing anchor presence, and but he wasn't hired because he was Bernard Shaw. He was hired because he was a fine anchor presence. And then what happened is over time, and this is true of all parts of our society, you have to be, and, and it goes back to the whole dissolution of the presidency. You know, it used to be you were a good, solid statesperson, statesman, and that's what got you elected. But when you once you had to appear on television and sound articulate, that whole um, addition changed how we elect people. Not instantly. I mean, although you can argue, what, what's the whole line about the 1960 
Democratic, um, I mean, sorry, the presidential election was the people who heard that debate felt that Nixon won it. But if they saw it, they felt that Kennedy won it because they just by the delivery systems of the this media. Um, so I that's just what I'm asking people is, is to think about how it's slowly over time. But I'll tell you what, uh, Lisa, the connection tech, uh, technology wise that connects all this to where we are today has nothing to do per se with cable news. What it has to do with what Tony was talking about, what it, you talk about in your last chapter, the shuttle blowing up in front of millions of people. It empowered the audience to actually be the journalists themselves, taking us to where we are today, the democratization of people holding up their cell phones and recording things, putting them up on the web, going Facebook Live, going TikTok. That's the connecting tissue from the early days of CNN, capitalizing on its ability to be live. Hello, Tom, are you listening? Oh. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and, and the inner, where we stand today in a social media society. You're right. No, and, no. and CNN was the first piece of that because before, before there was videotape and videotape could be rushed to air or before satellite would allow a signal. That's why I love starting this book with the whole idea of a live shot before there was such a thing because we've always had that need we want to see what's going on we want to know we want to communicate with each other you're absolutely right and it's definitely impacted how we all consume the news we're much more sophisticated um and it's not packaged up in a little bow and that's what reese was fighting for and ted cavanaugh too back in the 70s um they saw a different way of delivering news and information that, that was just not technologically possible then um so it's very, it's very interesting lisa um and and scott leon is there and, and may agree with this that in the old days the guest or the commentator or the person who wrote the book or the former secretary of state and rest we fought, those of us who put those people on, fought with the producers to give us some time to let somebody bring in some expertise. And what the producer wanted was the video and the news, what we wanted, which was the evolving story. And here we are 40 years later, <laughs> and it feels to me like we have a talk show looking for the video. Yep. I mean, it, it feels totally upside down from the way it was in 1985 or 1990. And the video isn't shot by a skilled camera person. It's shot by me on this TV studio in my hand. It's crazy how, yeah, it's okay. incredible. <laughs> my phone thinks I'm talking Judy, to it, sorry. Judy Milestone, do, you, do I hear you? Judy Milestone. I thought I, thought I heard Judy start to say something. I wish she would. Right. I knew she was there. I thought I heard her voice. Uh, so I, I have a question, and, and it's really for everybody um, that, that's interested. And if we get Judy back again, um, so can WGN reinvent TV news? Lisa, what do you think? With you. What do you think? I, I think it's valiant that they're trying to do it. And it's exactly what happened at around the same time that CNN started 40 years ago. There was independent network news on a group of independent stations. Uh, you know, it didn't, it didn't last. Uh, it lasted a while. Um, and that was before points of view were commonplace in, in news. So I think it's a valiant attempt, but I, I I can't believe they're able to bankroll it. But, you know, I worked when Tom Johnson got the job. I worked for Paul Amos, who left um, and he went to work for Fox News Service and Fox News Service hired him. You may remember this and a bunch of other CNNers. He, he brought CNNers with him. But Fox at the time has had just expanded to own um, stations or they were allowed to buy stations around the nation. And this is way, be way before ales, et cetera. And basically Paul's job was to set up a news service to service the Fox affiliates because the Fox affiliates uh, 
accountants didn't want to pay CNN to buy its video anymore. And so they hired a bunch of people who were out from CNN. And, you know, that worked for a while for them and it saved them having to pay the the rival, so to speak. Um, and then, of course, we know what happened after that. So I don't know. I, I don't know what's going to happen with, with WGN. But I, I did my best to persuade Paul to stay. Uh, Paul just simply could not accept that I had been brought in uh, on it. But uh, I mean, the, the guy absolutely had some extraordinary, like creative, uh, futuristic ideas, among other things. And, uh, you know, I, I should also tell you, you know, Ted wanted to have a bureau in every capital of every nation on the planet. I mean, wow. literally, if we could have afforded it, he would have liked to have had a news bureau in every important capital uh, in the world. And, and, and we continue to, to, to add them. But, but also, uh, Ted didn't run it by the numbers. I mean, we talked to er early. I mean, uh, uh, Ted, Ted would give us the authority to do whatever we needed to do. And I especially saw that when we, in the run-up to the war in, in the Gulf. I mean, I went up to his office and asked him how much I was permitted to spend to sort of own the story. He had always said he wanted to be the best uh, network on the planet. And, and we gave him a couple of estimates. One, I think, was 24, 24 million. The other was 30 million. And I said, Ted, tell me what I'm authorized to spend. He said, you spend whatever you think it takes, pal. I walked out of there, Ed Turner and I guess, and, and so we set up every circuit, every up lake, every ground station, everything that we could, we could set up. Scott will remember this especially. But, you know, it was it was just a, an attitude of the spirit of the commitment uh, that, that, that he had. And I mean, and I walked down to the hall to tell Terry McGurk and the finance people, including uh, uh, Paul, what Ted had approved. I mean, of course, they sort of put their head in their hands. But, you know, in the end, uh, not only did we own the story, but we came out making many millions of dollars more. Plus, it propelled us into cable services all over the world uh, uh, and, and the whole globalization in, in a way. But that spirit was what, you know, was there when Ted started it. Uh, that spirit stayed there all the way through his tenure. Uh, and, 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 you know, the, the tragedy for me still is, you know, why would you push Ted out of something that he has built? Not just CNN, but the others. Why would you push him out? He had, I think, 200 million shares of stock. Uh, and, and to me, nobody has been able to get Jerry to describe that. Uh, I mean, sure, Ted wanted to cut back on the number of corporate planes and all the incredible artwork in the, in, in the Time Warner building and a lot of things like that. But to, to me, if somebody can answer that, I, I'd love to have it as somehow a part of history. But you know, Gail, one of the things that's interesting to me, those of us that worked with Bert Reinhardt, and as, as you and Lisa mentioned, Bert could squeeze a penny. Um, and then suddenly we had um, Tom and the, uh, we had the opportunity to, to spend money. Uh, for the first time, and that was a big change. Well, it took. It was a Gail, Gail called me in one morning. He said, "You know, people don't realize how much she really ran my life uh, during my eleven years." But she said, "You need to go to Moscow today." And uh, I said, "Why?" She said, "Well, Ted Koppel's in Moscow, along I think with a, this producer named Rick Kaplan, and you need to go over and book uh, Gorbachev for his resignation." And, and I guess Boris Yeltsin coming in, well, you know, we hopped on the plane and we were in Moscow and we wound up get, getting the interviews. And it was just, it, there, was a, there was a spirit, uh, at least when I got there. And I, thank goodness, though, Bert enabled CNN to get to a point uh, where we could make it flourish in, in so many ways that there had been restrictions on it after all of those in the early, in the early, in the early era. Yeah. If it hadn't yeah, been let's for just do a couple more questions. Right. Uh, so, uh, Lisa, go ahead, and then I have one more question, and anybody else, please jump in. No, I was just going to say it. Had it took it really took the trajectory that it that it laid out to be unintentionally with Bert stepping in, and if Bert hadn't been there and and kept it going, 
then we would not have gotten to the point where Tom could come in. So it is just a fascinating evolution of, of the structure. And it really is, you'll see with my NPR book, very similar to what happened to NPR. It's, it's actually really kind of amazing. Right, except yeah. for your NPR book, you write about how the girls ran everything. Yeah. And yeah. it was the boys, right? Well, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Bill thinks the girls should run everything now, too. I mean, it's well, a strong belief of his that yeah. we guys have screwed it up so badly, turn it all over to you. So, so Lisa, I'm curious, what was the most, uh, I will say before, I remember, Bert, if you spent $200, Bert had to sign off on it. I mean, that's how tight it was back in the in the in those days in '83 and '84 and things like that. I mean, the idea of jumping out of plane to Moscow is like you would have had you would have had to use your own credit card um, because Bert would never have approved it. Wow! Uh, but I'm curious uh, to know what was the most surprising thing you learned about Ted or, and, the, and the building of Turner Broadcasting when you were doing your research? Wow. I think, you know, I think the most surprising thing was that all the obstacles, I didn't, I knew obviously it was a lean and mean place in the very early days, but I didn't realize all the obstacles that he had to overcome to, to press that day on June 1st, 1980, that, that to go on the air, I, that there were so many times up until that day that it could have just not you know fallen apart. I knew it was precarious for years afterwards, but all the obstacles up front. Um, I think the other thing that was interesting to me about him, because I'd never thought about it, was just how conservative he was before he got into the news business and before he was hanging around all of you um, and seeing the possibilities of news. I think knowing that he didn't really care about news and that he was decidedly more conservative than I imagined were two big, big revelations to me. That and the yachts, the yachts, you know, wow. I, I think he's unparalleled in yachting. Uh, I mean, maybe he is by now, but then he was, he was something. And that he was doing that while he was running companies and people like Paul Beckham were keeping the companies going really interesting we have any more questions from anybody i can't see wait a second um dna may have gotten the story but it didn't prevent oh okay the bogus gulf war what if people had to say about cnn being a force for good or not so good and some examples well, I mean, Ted, Ted, of course, the Goodwill Games, right? I mean, that was, it wasn't CNN so much, but um, I, I don't know. I, I haven't thought about it as a force for good, except there is this very detailed, I spent a lot of time talking to Mike Betcher about Ted in Cuba with Fidel Castro and how that was both revolutionary and controversial and important for him personally in seeing that CNN could be, could create this global village. So that was definitely a key piece of those early years. I don't know. So, and he can say what he wants to about the bogus war, but that's yeah. another example where the American audiences were never taken to a war live. They never had to see a, re a war reporter like Charles Jaco suddenly have to worry about his life in front of the camera live. And that's another little known, little regarded aspect of what CNN was trying to do at that time that again speaks to where we're at now. Right, Tiananmen Square, right, is another example that people could see a revolution unfolding in front of their very eyes. Is that good? Is that bad? I think it's good. Uh, I'm sure there are people who would argue that it's not, especially if you're the oppressor and you don't want people to see that changes or to see live and during the tenement square to see the chinese government trying to get alec moran to shut cnn down and the whole thing unfolding in front of the entire universe and that was something the audience had never seen before i would submit that cnn has been an enormous force for good on this planet 
that CNN was able to provide truthful, factual information to so many peoples of countries that had been living right. under repression, had, under dictatorships, had did not know, except for occasionally being able to get the radio version of the BBC, what, what was happening. I mean, and even now in North Korea, it's virtually locked down to all outside, except a few television sets that are available in different hotels. But in, in my view, CNN has been and is an incredible force for good. Uh, and, and I just hope that, uh, you know, I hope that the current owners, AT&T and the current leaders of that will continue to, 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 to just search for being the best. Uh, CNN is very profitable, according to my sources, but continue to make it the very best news service that, that, that there is. Yeah. And, you know, Gail, that's that's probably a good good point to uh, wrap it up with. Um, if you have not read um, out of uh, up, up All Night, it is really a fascinating book. Uh, I, I just thoroughly enjoyed it. And you learn so much about uh, about CNN and how it how it miraculously got to be what it is. I am delighted to have had uh, Lisa Napoli and Gail Evans and especially Tom Johnson join us tonight. So thanks to you all. Thanks for joining us. And uh, we got to get together again sometime soon. Thank you all for being here tonight. Thank you so much. Thank you Thank very you. much.